Good morning, class. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Anybody remember what happens at Faith School? <laughs> said out loud, everybody, everybody said out loud, my spirit is fed. My faith grows stronger, and I learn how to be an overcomer. It's happening. We're growing. We're developing. We're overcoming. Get your Bible and get something to make a note with. Come into the classroom with us today. Let's release faith for more answers. Father, we, we look to you. We ask you to give us this day our, our daily bread and, and our spiritual bread for answers, direction, and help. We give you the glory and praise for every good thing that we enjoy, and we thank you for bringing us up higher. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, please, in Acts, the 14th chapter, let's continue. In our study of this fourth individual account of healing in the uh, book of Acts, we've talked a lot about it. And you, if you haven't been with us, go online to faithschool.org, faithschool.org, and you can look at all the previous cases that we've studied. It'll help you. Uh, class, some of you were here on some of those. Do you recommend that they go back and get the previous one? It's worth your time, I believe. And it won't cost you anything. There's no charge. We've gotten down to this one today, the healing of the lame man at Lystra. In verse 7, let's, let's read some more about it. There they preached the gospel. There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a crippled from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped and walked. So this set off a chain of events. Everybody heard about it in town and knew about it. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices and they said in the speech of Lycaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, which is the Greek Zeus, and Paul Mercurius, that's Roman, but the Greek is Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. So we know from this, Paul did most of the teaching and preaching, I guess, most of the talking. And, and then the priest of Jupiter, or Zeus, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So all the people there, they were ready to worship Paul and Barnabas. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they rent or they tore, ripped their clothes. They ran in among the people of the crowd, shouting and crying out and said, Sirs, why do you do these things? We are men of like passions with you. We've been preaching to you that you should turn from these vanities, these worthless things, unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all things that are therein. See, he just covered what would have been, I don't know, half a dozen of their gods. He said, no, God did all that. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he, God, left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. You know, Jesus said that we are to be followers uh, or imitators of God in that uh, he is kind and good even to the unjust, even to the evil, even to the unthankful. God is kind and good to the unjust and people who don't even appreciate it and acknowledge it. Well, you don't have to look far to see that. What's he talking about? Rain, crops, food. There are all kind of people that blaspheme God that are enjoying his food, that are benefiting from, he lets rain fall on their places too. He lets the seed work for them and the earth work for them. That's what, he, that's what he's talking about. God has not left himself without a witness. I've heard people say, well, there is no proof of God. Are you joking? You're standing on proof of God. You're breathing proof of God. Everything around you, the Bible said, that God's eternal power uh, 
the, the Godhead and, and his eternal power is revealed in the things that are made. You want to know about God, the reality of God? Don't dust off some book on theology. Go look up in the night sky. Look across a mountain range. Look across the Pacific Ocean. That's God. Hallelujah. Look at the wonder of a tree, a flower. You know, the Bible said that God made Solomon the wisest man, gave him wisdom above any and more than any that had come before him and after him. And the Bible said that Solomon wrote thousands of uh, poems and songs and things, and he wrote about trees and flowers and plants. Why? Because the wisdom of God is in them. You will see the wisdom of God in a flower, in a blade of grass, in a leaf on a tree, in the tree's root system, in an animal, in the sky, in water, in all its different states, vapor and ice. And you will, that's God. That's his wisdom. And so foolish, deceived human beings wondered at these things and believed the devil's lies and created gods for all of these things. But it's a lie. There's just one God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God, the one, created the heavens and the earth. And that's what he's saying. God has created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything that's in it. And he, he's reigned on the just and unjust. I've heard people quote that like it's a bad thing. Rain's a blessing. <laughs> rain's a good thing. So, so well, he, he sends his rain on the just and unjust, and they kind of shake their head. That's God being merciful and kind. He's good to the unthankful. He's kind to the unjust. What a kind God he What a good God he is. Aren't you glad he's your, your papa, your daddy, your father? And so with these sayings, they scarce restrained the people that they had not done sacrifice to them. And, but then there came, and there must not have been much of a time passage here. Right after that, there came Jews from Antioch and Iconium, and they persuaded the people. What people? Well, that same area. People in that same area, probably some of the same bunch that was ready to worship them not, not long before. And they stoned Paul. Stoned him. And drew him or dragged him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So now, they didn't mean to hurt him. They meant to kill him. And so, stoning is when you pick up a rock and you throw it as hard as you can to kill something, to kill somebody. And so, new numbers of them hurled rocks and big rocks at Paul and they hit him in different parts of his body and at the very least he's unconscious and very likely actually dead uh, because if they could have detected life about him they wouldn't have done right they would have thrown more rocks they would have done more things they were convinced he's dead they drug his body out of the, wherever they were in the city, out to the outskirts. Like a carcass of an animal they're disposing of. Well, the disciples, people that had come to believe on Jesus through Paul's ministry and Barnabas, they, uh, they came out and stood round about him. The words mean they made a circle around him. Make, you know, get the picture, Paul's body's laying there, bloody, uh, lacerations, all kind of things. Everybody thinks he's dead. And, and maybe he was. But it said, as they stood around him, he rose up. He got up. That same word, that, those Greek words, they're translated get up like a person gets up. But several times they're translated rose up like rose from the dead. Same words. Same words translated that Christ rose from the dead. That's the same word as here. 
So I'm, I'm not saying, because the Bible doesn't say clearly enough to, that I've seen it, but either way, whether almost dead or all the way dead, it's a miracle that he could get up. Can you see that? He stands up. Don't you know they all praised God? They thought their man of God was gone. But he stands up. He rose up. And then he, he goes into the city. And the next day. Somebody say the next day. He departs with Barnabas to Derby. Now these, these cities are miles and miles apart. And they're on foot. So man, God did something for him, right? That he is able to make this trip. And when they had preached the gospel, so he's preaching too, <laughs> to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra. <laughs> wow. He went straight back to where he got stoned at and preached to them again. Now, we talked about this earlier in verse uh, 6. When they first heard of these folks' plan to stone them, they left town. And obviously, that's what they should have done. I mean, they had a lot of people believe, and they had this man healed over in Lystra. You know, obviously, God's helping them with them. But now, instead of running, they went right back where they had been stoned. He had been stoned. So you might say, well, which one do you do? There's only one way to get it right. You got to pray and you got to hear from God. You got to be led by the Spirit. But it's obvious he's not being led by fear. So you might think after you either died or came that close to death, there are some people might think, well, man, I'm quitting this. I mean, I'm, right, I'm going home. <laughs> this is too dangerous. And they certainly wouldn't go back because if people thought they killed you and were happy about it and they find out you're not dead, what might they want to do? Finish the job. Is that right? So, but he goes right back into it, right back to Lystra. And then to Iconium, that's where the stoner propagators came from, <laughs> was Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. What's he talking about? He's talking about persecution for the gospel's sake. And you will encounter some persecution if you follow God all the way. And you got to be willing to, to take some licks and punches and hits here and there. Now, with this in mind, I want you to go with me over to... Um, the book of uh, Colossians, I believe it is. Oh, thank you, Lord. Actually, I tell you what, let's, let's do it this way. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians 4. We'll look at a passage here in, in Timothy as well, 2 Timothy. But there is something here that I've heard people preach on and I think get wrong and use to rob people of their faith. In Galatians, the fourth chapter, it would benefit to realize that the regions of Galatia are exactly where we've been reading and talking about. The old maps that say Galatia is just north of these towns, Lystra. And so when he wrote letters to the churches at Galatia, if you read other letters, he would tell them to read these letters in the other parts of that, that area and them to read the, uh, the letters vice versa. So these letters, uh, letters to the Galatians, this is to the people, uh, including the people that we've been reading about in Acts. Lystra, Derby, Iconium, that area, and north of there. And in Galatians, the fourth chapter, and uh, 13, he says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel to you, at the first. This is the first time he came to them to preach the gospel. We have a record of that. Acts 13 and 14. And he said, when I did, I had an infirmity of the flesh. Now, some of your modern translations will say, I had a disease. Or I was sick. And that's not accurate. 
The word infirmity literally means weakness. Weakness or feebleness. Now it could be, you could be weak and feeble because of a disease, but that's not the only reason you could be weak and feeble. It literally means, we talked about this a couple of classes ago, you got to watch about playing fast and loose with the scriptures, right? And using words that you think fits. No, let it say exactly what it said. Don't add to it, don't take from it. Now he said it was through a, a, a weakness of the flesh. I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh, that word temptation means trial or test. The trial I had or the test that was in my flesh, you didn't despise nor reject, but you received me as an angel or a messenger of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now I've heard people build whole unscriptural doctrines off of this phrase, infirmity in the flesh. There's this, this one thing I read. It said, you know, what happened is that Paul had ophthalmia, an eye, a disease of the eyes, and that when he was trying to preach to them, he had unspeakable pus and matter, you know, running out of his eyes. And, and where'd you get that? <laughs> You are making stuff up. No. Oh, he had this terrible disease that God wouldn't heal him from. And if God wouldn't heal Paul, why do you think he wouldn't heal you? That is nowhere in the Bible. That's people making stuff up. He said he had a weakness in his flesh the first time he came and preached to them. And that if it had been possible, they would have given him their eyes. Do we know of anything that happened the first time he went to preach to them that might cause a weakness in the flesh? The man was stoned to death, or almost, right? What is the primary target in stoning? The head. Is that right? So everybody was trying to hit him in the head with big rocks, and they did. And rocks hit him in the skull, rocks hit him in the forehead, rocks hit him in the eyes. The eyes, the face. We know God did something for him because he was able to rise up and didn't die. We know God did something for him. He was able to travel the next day. We know God did something for him because he went to the next town and preached. And then came right back into town where they stoned him and preached to them again. But we would be wrong to assume that all of his injuries from stoning were instantaneously healed. That's a, that's a presumption. That's an assumption. And we actually have some indication that it healed up naturally over time. Why do you say that, brother? Read Galatians 6, the 6th chapter, and the 17th verse. And this is an interesting phrase here to me. Galatians 6, 17. In closing, he said, uh, From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The, uh, the complete Jewish Bible says, From now on, I don't want anyone to give me any more suris. That's, that's one of their words they use. That means trouble. It means Quit bothering me about this. Don't bother. Why? I have scars in my body that prove that I belong to Yeshua, Jesus. I, have, I bear on my body scars. Where did he get these scars? Well, we know there were other things too. He was beaten with rods. He, he was stoned. And so this thing about God, you know, Paul had this rare eye disease and he never could get healed from. That's junk. And, and, and it's contrary, it's something from the enemy to try to rob people of their faith and say, well, hey, if Paul couldn't get healed, what makes you think you can get healed? Lies, somebody say lies. Lies, lies 
lies from the enemy. We've got scripture that tell us what was going on. We have revelation. The man got stoned. Look in 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. In writing to Timothy, he's having to encourage him. 2 Timothy 1 7. He said, God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Be not there therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Skip over to the third chapter, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. He said, you have fully known my doctrine, my teaching, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, long-suffering, love, and patience, persecutions and afflictions which came to me at Antioch and where? Iconium and where? Lystra. What persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse Verse 12, yea and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer rare eye disease. (laughs) Huh? Incurable sickness. No. No. We're not redeemed from persecution. Paul endured persecution. A lot of it. But man, he got a lot done too. What kind of reward does the man have? Huh? We're still preaching on his teachings today, aren't we? Right here today. We're not redeemed from suffering any persecution. And and persecution is not fun. And persecution can even get violent. It did with him. But we are redeemed from the curse of the law. So don't tell me Paul was sick and couldn't get healed any more than I'm going to believe that Jesus was sick and couldn't get healed. Huh? Don't tell me that. Because I have already read that all sickness and all disease is part of the curse of the law. And Christ has redeemed us. Huh? In this same book of, of Galatians in the third chapter, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. He didn't say he suffered from disease, debilitating problems. No, we got the pieces. We've got the story. If you look at it and see it, he was stoned. He was stoned bad. They thought he was dead. He might have been dead. Primary target, the head. And so, have you ever seen somebody that got hit really hard in the eyes? Man, your eyes will look bad. I mean, they're bloodshot. You swell up. I mean, and this is what they're seeing when he's preaching to them. That first time he comes around, he's still healing up from these lacerations. He's bruised badly. And part of his message is you got to be willing (laughs) to, to endure some persecution to get this message out. But nothing is said about the man being sick and couldn't get healed. These are all fabrications of people trying to explain things, why they hadn't received or why they haven't seen the things that they want to see. Don't change the Bible. Can you say amen? Amen. Don't add to the word. Don't take from it. Uh, Go back there to, to our passage, our text again, Acts 14. It said, verse 19, that they stoned the man and they supposed he was dead. They drug him out of the city. As the disciples came and stood round about him, what were they saying and doing while they were standing there? Well, if they followed Paul's example, they'd have been praying. Is that right? Looking to God, endeavoring to believe God. Do we say, what do we say? What do we do? Oh, God, we don't want Paul to be gone. We don't want to lose our man of God right now. And all at once, there's movement. (laughs) Hey, glory to God. And Paul got up, rose up, and uh, came into the city. 
And the next day, I said, well, Barnabas? He said, yeah, I'm surprised you're already awake. He said, yeah, let's go to Derby. Let's hold a meeting in Derby. You, uh, you ready for a meeting? Yeah, let's go. And he went in the strength of the Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many know he knew what he's talking about when he said, I can do all things <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. That, those are his words, the Spirit of God's words through his mouth. And he knew it. He proved it. He saw it. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, confirming the souls, exhorting them to stay with the faith, and that through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. How many want to be that kind of stalwart soldier of the Lord? Hallelujah. In kingdom business. So somebody said out loud, I will stand, I will stand. And, and preach the word and tell the word and be a witness for him through persecution. Hallelujah. That's it for today. Come back next time. There's a lot more to learn about faith in the living God. We'll see you soon back here in Faith School. Really enjoyed being with you again this week. I know we're making progress. I always like to say at the end of the week, thank you to all of our partners that are so faithful to pray for us, believe with us, support this ministry financially. Thank you. If you want to be a partner, there's information on the screen there. I want to remind you that the Bible says that uh, whatever a person sows, they're able to reap. The scripture says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Uh, there are things that will try to talk you out of it. If you watch the wrong things, you will decide, well, I can't have it now. I can't receive it now. But don't walk by sight. Walk by faith. I want you to say it out loud. I'm a giver and I'm a receiver. I'm a sower and I am a reaper. I will reap bountiful harvest off of every good seed I have sown. Hallelujah. By the anointing in our lives, we speak over you increase in blessing. And Phyllis and I and all the staff, we are agreeing with you, expecting bountiful harvests of good things in your life off of every good seed sown here. Thank you for being hooked with us. We'll see you again next week here in Faith School. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.